Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Talent Gap Fireside Chat, where we talk about causes of and solutions to the talent gap. I'm your host, Pete Strauss, and joining me today is Chris Furtick. Uh, Chris is VP of Client Solutions over at Fortalis. Welcome, Chris. Thanks so much for having me, Pete. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here. Could you give our audience a brief description of your career and how you came to be today um, where you are, professionally speaking? Yeah, of course. So uh, I am the VP of Client Solutions over at Fortalis uh, Solutions. I'm also the Managing Director of Incident Response and Security Engineering. So we're multiple hats there. Uh, we're a consulting firm. We focus on penetration testing, governance, and security leadership. So I've been in the industry about 12 years now, and I'm a prime example of someone who came from a non-traditional background into cybersecurity. So I started out working in blue team, uh, working in SIMS, doing um, administration and deployments, worked my way through the rest of the blue team uh, tools, DLP, vulnerability management, EDR. Uh, and then I transitioned over to incident response. So I did incident response for some time and then uh, functioned as an incident commander. Now I spend most of my time in security leadership and function as a fractional CISO for several companies. So it's been a great ride. Awesome. Well, that's a great varied uh, background that you have there. So um, I usually start off the conversation by talking about, you know, is the, the talent gap real? So what's your view on that? Is the talent gap real? And if so, what does it look like? Yeah, so I certainly believe that the talent gap is real, um, but I think there's a couple of different reasons for that. So first off, if we look at InfoSec as a profession, we're relatively immature. Uh, many of the other uh, professionals uh, that came before us in other areas, right? Think about accounting, think, uh, several other areas had to go through these growing pains, which I think that's we're going through um, as InfoSec professionals at this time. So I believe it's real. I believe we have to get better at bringing more people into the fold uh, and whatever that looks like. Maybe we're bringing in junior folks and, and we've got to make sure we've got a process to bring them up. But the talent gap is real. But I think it's a lot of growing pains. I think in 10, 12, 15 years, we won't be having nearly the same conversation. We will have a flood of additional people in, in our uh, fold. And I think it's an exciting time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the question is just, you know, how do we get all the people interested in the field on board and in the doors? Um, so, you know, if the, if the talent gap is real, what in your mind does it look like? Where does it exist? Like, are there certain subdisciplines of security that you see being the, the hardest positions to fill or have the least amount of candidates for? Yeah, so there's a couple different things that we're talking about here. I think a well-rounded uh, security professional is the best kind. So, if you come and you uh, only want to focus on red teaming, right? We hear folks, uh, I want to be a penetration tester. I want to wear the hoodie. I want to be the hacker. I want to hack all the things. Uh, that's not a very well-rounded security practitioner, right? It's almost like a one-trick pony. So I think we've got to get more people in in different areas and then transition them throughout security. So when you're asking about what the biggest gap is, I see folks breaking in in socks, right? They, they, it's relatively... Um, uh, ubiquitous SOC positions that you can get, but they want to quickly move. I think the more they can learn in an enterprise environment, especially, I think the better off that they are. So uh, as far as specific areas that we're lacking on, I think we're lacking everywhere. Uh, I don't know that I believe the gazillion jobs that they say go unfilled. I, I don't believe those statistics. Uh, and, and I've heard you talk about that previously, about how one role may be uh, you know, positioned by 10 or 12 different folks looking for it. So I think those numbers are a bit inflated. Um, so, but those are some of the challenges that I see, but I'm really interested in hearing what you think about it, right? Where do you see the gaps and what are you seeing across the industry? Yeah, I mean, I, I talk about it a lot. Really, I think the, the biggest gap that we have is just at the, the mid to senior level, individual contributor level. Everybody who's at that level currently wants to be in management. I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people. Uh, at that level, want to be in management, and then you have a lot of people that are trying to break into the industry, but there's there's no gap there. There's plenty of those folks. So um, yeah, there's there's just kind of a gap right there in the middle um, where everybody wants to hire the senior individual contributors who don't require any training, who can quote unquote hit the ground running, as as hackneyed as that phrase is. Um, it's it's one that I've heard very often. Um, some skill sets that. I've seen this evolve actually quite a bit in the last year or so. Um, about a year ago, there was a huge lack of uh, of the DFIR consulting skill set. There weren't enough of those folks to respond to all these breaches and ransomware cases. 
Uh, and then all of a sudden, just like that, it's like you snapped your fingers and the demand for, for those folks has gone way down, I think, because of uh, some of the slowdown in ransomware. Um, there's always been a need for GRC, uh, for IT auditors and compliance assessors and things like that. I've done a lot of work in that space specifically. Um, all the consulting firms out there, they can basically hire as many as they possibly can and still not be caught up to the amount of work they have coming in the door. Um, there's less of a shortage, I think, uh, of like offensive security folks because there's so many people that are trying to to break into that subdiscipline of security that maybe are a generalist security engineer right now. And but they've always wanted to be a pen tester because everybody wants to be a pen tester, like you said. Um, so I, I think there's a little bit less of a of a lack there. Um, that said, I think good senior, strong, really technical, outside the box thinking pen testers, not just you know um, script kitties, as they say. Uh, those folks are, are always in demand, and there may be a lack of those relative to the amount of people that that call themselves pen testers. And I'm sure you could break it down further. Other roles like cloud security that I don't see quite as much of personally as a recruiter. It just you know those roles haven't crossed my desk as much, but that's always needed. Um, identity and access management. There's a lot of work to be done there. So uh, I think really in my mind the way I qualify it is that it's it's the level of experience more than it is the the individual subdiscipline of security. And would you wow. agree that a broad discipline uh, and broad skill set is is highly desirable? Does that kind of raise the resumes in your stack if someone has uh, multiple different disciplines? Um, it could go either way. It depends on the hiring manager. Some people like to see somebody very well rounded. Um, and I hate to give the answer. It depends. <laughs> uh, but some people like to see the very well rounded generalist security engineer. Some people want that person to have a, a very specific set of very narrow skills with a specific technology, which I think is how a lot of hiring teams shoot themselves in the foot. They're they're not considering transferable skills and they're only looking for that specific technology stack. Uh, when in all reality, if somebody knows a similar tool or skill set, they can probably pick it up very quickly if they're smart. So um, don't get me started there. But yeah, long story sure. short, I think it depends. Yeah, I think you're right, especially about the silos, right? We've created, uh, some organizations have created silos within their cybersecurity culture, right? We've got this tool set and we want this person to be that person um, forever, right? So they can't hire someone in who has um, you know skill set that they aren't looking for. And kind of to your point, I always liking it to uh, baking a cake, right? I can come to your house and I can bake you a cake. I may not know where your oven is already. I may not know where the eggs are, but I know how to bake a cake. So if you put me in a different environment and I can put the cake together, that should be what matters, right? I can still make a delicious cake in a kitchen I've never been in. Yeah, that's a, that's a great analogy. It might take you a little bit more time to cook a cake in, in a right. kitchen you're not familiar with, but you can get there. Uh, and, and I think people are discounting or they're they're not paying enough attention to how long it takes to hire a unicorn versus how quickly somebody could get ramped up if they're smart and they don't know that particular tool um i would say in 99 percent chance of cases um that person who's really smart and who's worked with similar technology um, they can get ramped up quicker if you hire them today than if you have to wait and keep your job open for six months uh looking for that unicorn so i Agreed. think looking at time in the hiring process is is very valuable um and and not enough people look at it that way time is money for sure um and so people get it in their heads that they they have to be very stringent about finding that perfect person in some cases that perfect person doesn't even exist so you could be waiting all that time for nothing and you end up not filling that role anyway with that perfect person and when you could have pulled the trigger six months ago and had somebody right. trained up in three, you know? Um, so, yeah. Well, that's an interesting point. And, and I know I'm picking your brain a little bit here, but how can I, as a hiring manager, not give you as a recruiter, a unicorn to find, right? How do you help coach me into getting a, a broader pool so I can make that hire more quickly? Yeah. And that's one thing I really pride myself on having recruited in this field for so long is speed to hire. And it is so crucial. Um, if you have people that are super in demand, like most of the senior individual contributors that everybody wants to hire, you have to move quickly. Uh, so some things that you can do um, 
I guess on the on the front end on the screening side to make sure that your requirements aren't too unrealistic we'll say um, keep that list of uh, must-haves in your job description to I would say no more than five anything beyond that and you're really running the risk of, of that person not existing or if that person does exist there's only two in the US and if that's the case you have to look at it uh, I always view recruiter uh, recruiting as a numbers game so um, you know if there's two people in the US and you get an average response rate from people of 25% that's not enough people to get a response. You know, you need right. at least four. Uh, but even then, you're lucky uh, if if you get one of those four people uh, and get them all the way through the interview process. So you have to think about how many people are out there. And a good recruiter can tell you, okay, does this person exist or not? If they do, yeah, there's only a few of them. Or you know, if we have thousands to choose from, great. Um, but it's a numbers game, so you have to you have to go with what the market is bearing for you. Um, so a good recruiter in your niche should be able to push back a little bit if, if uh, you know your your requirements aren't realistic. Uh, so that might be a good question to ask the recruiter that you're working with. Um, what do you think of this job description? Is this person out there? Uh, in some cases they won't be. In some cases they're like, oh yeah, yeah, no problem. That person we've worked with that person before. I have a couple in my database already. That's that's what you want to hear. Um, but if somebody pauses for a second and they're like, well, you know, you're probably not going to get cloud security and IAM and pen, t pen testing and GRC and incident response experience in the same person, um, that's when it might be time to adjust. So I say keep the number of bullets on the must have list short, and then you can put as many nice to haves as you want. Um, when you do that, though, the only thing that you're you're risking is if you post that job and you're relying on applicants. Uh, if the more requirements you have, the less likely people are to apply. Uh, so kind of an inverse relationship there. Um, yeah, but that's you know, SDS experts, I would say. Yeah, I was going to say that's great coaching and, and I really appreciate it. I found that the biggest uh, indicator of success when I work with a recruiter, where they're internal or external, is how much time I spend with a recruiter at the beginning of the job search, right? How much information can I give them or what I'm looking for? I'm not always looking for unicorns, but there are certain things that are non-negotiable, right? I have to have someone that has passion. I have to have someone that's willing to learn uh, and will fit in with my team. Inevitably, the more time that I spend on the front end and making sure that the recruiter is uh, on board with what I'm looking for and understands where I'm coming from, it just makes a recruitment process so much easier. It makes it so much easier for you all to bring me the right people. So I think it's uh, super valuable and important. Another thing you can ask the recruiter, too, is after you've kind of given your spiel and said, hey, this is, you know, uh, all the requirements I'm looking for, ask, ask that recruiter to recite back to you um, kind of the profile of how they view that person. Um, could you describe in your own words here what I'm looking for? Um, one, that's going to gauge their knowledge level <laughs> and if they actually know what you're talking about. Uh, and two, it gives you time to kind of create uh, correct something if they misunderstood something that you said. Um, so that's just kind of a rhetorical trick that that'll help make sure that you're on the same page. And to your point about, you know, spending time on the front end, yeah, super crucial. Uh, and I've said this in, in previous uh, episodes of the podcast, uh, the more time you spend on the front end, the less time you're going to have to spend on the back end and many multiples of that, I would say. Um, because if you spend just a little bit of time on the front end, that's going to save you from hours and hours of interviews that you wouldn't need to have if that recruiter was you know, screening people properly on the front end. Uh, and you bring up a point about intangibles too. Uh, that's something you absolutely want to cover with the recruiter. Uh, are you looking for somebody who's a team player and doesn't have a big ego? That's, that's a request I get sometimes is they got to be a team player. They can't you know, think their, their uh, bleep doesn't stink. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so definitely cover even the intangibles. Um, if there's something you don't care as much about that's in the job des description, make sure that you mention that. Uh, they need to know where there's some flexibility and where there isn't um, so that, again, we can broaden that candidate pool because the broader the candidate pool is, the more likely you are to get the right um, intangible fits um, in addition to just the the hard skills that you're looking for too. Oh, that's but, wonderful, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, you've been a hiring manager for a while now. Are there uh, certain challenges that you've encountered over the years that, 
you know, you've maybe found some solutions to, or, or maybe something that you think I might be able to have some input on? Yeah. So first off, we just talked about is how do we get the right people in, right? How do we find the right people? And when I'm able to work with the recruiter, either for my own team or when I'm building a security team for one of my clients, working with that recruiter is is critically important. We have to let uh, everyone know what we're looking for, right? And it comes out to having a prioritized list. These are the must-haves. These are the nice-to-haves. These are the things that I don't necessarily care about. Uh, The next thing is once we hire in people, we have to be willing, if we're going to hire in junior people, have a path for them, right? It's going to take them some time to get spun up. We are not going out to to find this unicorn. I'm hiring the junior person six months earlier for, you know, 50%, maybe 75% of the cost, but I'm going to raise them up into a senior person. But you have to be willing to put the time in to do that. That's some of the challenges that I've seen. Most companies aren't willing to put in the time uh, to take a junior resource and grow them into a senior resource. They think hiring a, a senior resource is like pressing the easy button, right? I can get someone uh, to come in, like you said, hit the ground running, I say, uh, to make a big impact. And they're not wrong. They can do that. But I would say growing engineers up and and building them into the people that you want them to be and the resources that you want them to be uh, does uh, several things, right? First off, it gives them a path to to being more senior. And we all need more senior uh, folks in our organizations. But it also gives them a loyalty to my organization. You know, you took a chance on them and you brought them in. Same kind of thing that happened with me about 12 years ago. I came in, didn't really know security at all. Someone took a chance on me um, and gave me an opportunity, gave me a shot. They didn't give me the passion. They didn't give me the, you know, the, the wherewithal to, to navigate uh, enterprises and, and the, the political uh, spectrum, but they gave me a shot to come in and say, hey, can, can you be a person that can make an impact? What they do with that opportunity is completely on the, the person, but that's why it's important to find the right people to come in. That's interesting. You mentioned the, the politics of some organizations. I think especially at, at larger companies, that becomes a bigger issue um, in politics as it relates to, to red tape and how you navigate that. Um, that's something I haven't covered in this podcast before. How do you identify somebody that's able to navigate red tape and politics? That seems like a pretty ethereal thing. <laughs> Just, yeah, you know. you're, you're not wrong. I've been in consulting my entire career, so I've seen a lot of different environments, both small and large. Uh, and oftentimes, the politics are, are what holds up uh, you know, a security person or a security program. And you're asking, how do we define that person? How do we find someone that can navigate the, uh, the buoys, so to speak? First off, I like to look for folks who have some type of customer service experience whether that's help desk, maybe they worked in restaurants, maybe they worked in retail. Those folks have found a way, uh, especially if they spent any time in any of those uh, type of roles, they found a way to deal with people. So they may not understand the politics of of a big organization, but they know how to read people and how to make people happy. So that's one of the biggest things that I look for is someone is coming to me and they're transitioning from a different role. If they've got any type of customer service, and that could be almost anything, right? If you've worked with the public, and had to deal with an angry person either in a restaurant, you know, someone upset that their steak wasn't cooked properly, or you've worked in retail and someone wanted to return something that was six months old, you've understood how to work with people. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here, the intangible things. So customer service is one of the big things that I think um, are helpful. If I can find someone that came from a help desk and is t- trying to transition to cybersecurity, first off, I'm asking their company, why aren't you taking this person and transitioning in your own uh, system, right? Next off, I, I want to understand how can I get this person in? Because if they understand enterprise culture uh, as well as the infrastructure, then it makes it a really easy sell to bring them over into security. Very cool. Yeah, you mentioned help desk, and I think that's often known as a, a popular pathway for the entry level folks to get into security. And some would make the argument that security is not truly an entry level field. Um, what do you say to the, the candidates out there? And there's quite a few out there um, that, that have this mindset I'm about to describe. Uh, I, I went through my degree program. I got my bachelor's in cybersecurity. I got my security plus. Um, and, you know, the, the university was telling me I'll graduate and I'll make six figures. Um, can you make a case to that person? Like, look, man, you're, you're going to have to go get some experience. Um, before you're going to be able to, to be head and shoulders above your peers and hireable at the entry level, especially given the fact that uh, we, we don't necessarily have a lack of people at the entry level. Um, can you convince that person that says they need to make, make that kind of salary 
to take an entry level help desk job? Yeah, so that's uh, sometimes a tough pill to swallow, but I think it's an incumbent upon us as hiring managers and as seniors who have seen some stuff uh, to be able to impart that on our new colleagues who are joining the workforce. So, uh, you know, colleges and boot camps and, and a lot of training like that says, come take our course, come get our degree, and you'll be, uh, to your point, you know, making 100K in, in three weeks or whatever it is. Uh, that's not necessarily the ra- reality that I'm seeing. Of course, those uh, jobs may exist. That's just not what I'm seeing in, in, in our company or in our uh, clients' companies. So first off, I have to reset expectations. Like, yeah, I know that you have this degree, and, and I'm really thankful that we're able to talk. Uh, you took Security Plus, so we have a common nomenclature. We can talk about security. We can talk about security tools. That's great. What I need to see from you is passion, first off, right? I need you to say that you're, you know maybe you have a home lab, but that's kind of table stakes at this point. The thing that we've been telling folks, go build your home lab and you know get Security Onion or get Cali or whatever else and, and build up your skills that way. I think it's great advice, but I can look at 20 resumes and it, over half of them have home labs already and they're publishing on GitHub. And I think that's great, but that's not the differentiator that it used to be. I think what we have to look for is more folks who are contributing to the community. So maybe you're volunteering at your local B-sides. I think local B-sides are, are really great. You get a good bit of information and you can network with folks really easily there. Also, I think you have to build your own personal network. So looking at LinkedIn, following the folks that you think um, have really good content uh, and also commenting on what they're posting, right? If you found a post insightful, comment on them and and build your network in that way. These are things that are differentiators. Again, 20 different resumes. Everyone went to XYZ College. Everyone has Security Plus and everyone's working on OSCP, right? I can quote it from you. I've seen so many of them. You've got to differentiate yourself. Though. You've got to be something. There's got to be something there for me to say, why are, you, why are we talking? Why should I hire you? And I'll often go back to the recruiter with that question. Like, of all the gazillion resumes that you have, why did you bring this person to me? There may be something I'm not seeing. Maybe there's something that you know from having the relationship with that person uh, that would make them rise to the top. And I think that's critically important. Yeah, very cool. Um, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. There's a lot of advice out there about setting up your home lab and, you know, getting involved on LinkedIn and following the streams and, and all stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's there's really just not enough entry level jobs for all of these people to end up in. Uh, and especially if tens of thousands of people all have home labs and all appear, you know, passionate and things like that. It's like, you know, uh, great. But something has to change to to be able to onboard these folks into the industry. So um, so how yeah. do we change that, right? You say we have a, an enormous supply. We don't have as much uh, jobs for them to come in. How do we change a mindset for companies to want to bring in junior folks? And, and how do we, what do we need to do as organizations to attract these folks and raise them up? And what are your thoughts? What should we do? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it all comes down to money. Um, I think you need to be able to to justify from a monetary standpoint, um, building a training program and, and being realistic about how long it's going to take. Um, maybe asking other folks, which is a big part of what this podcast is all about, but asking other folks how they did it and um, understanding what time and monetary investment is going to be involved on the front end and what to expect on the back end, um, you know, how long is it going to take realistically before this person's ready to go? Say they have, you know, a six month internship or something, and uh, that's all the experience they have and they have their security plus. How long is it going to take that candidate in that situation? You know, and that might be, say, the average candidate. How long is it going to take before that person's ready in this, you know, junior security engineer role that I have? Um, so I think picking the brains of the people that have done it before um, would, would probably be the best way to do it. And, you know, I, in my mind, the best way to do that is networking through LinkedIn, probably um, organizations uh, like ISACA or IC Squared, uh, ISSA, basically the, the places that security professionals and especially executives hang out uh, and just try and find some folks that have done it before. And um, I try to get most of those folks on this podcast. That's that's kind of the idea. Um, but ultimately, I think it comes down to time and money. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I agree with you 100%. And what I'm not sure folks factor into that, you know, you talked about how long it's going to take this junior person to come up. What they don't often factor in is how much time can I 
devote my senior resources into growing them up, right? Yet we say it's going to be three, four, five, six months to get this person uh, usable. But what about the folks who have to train them up, right? Is it going to be a drain on the team? These are all things that you have to figure out. How do we how do we do that, right? It's easy to say that you know we're going to you know burn some capital on this person for a few months to train them. But we also have to give the senior people on our team time to mentor them, time to train them up. So well, we have to have a pathway for them. What is a waste, in my opinion, is to do all that work and not have a pathway for them to get to senior, right? We have to make sure we map that out because if we grow this person up, we want them to stay in the organization, right? We've made this investment with them. We want to make sure that they stay. So I don't think folks... Uh, put enough critical thought into what it's going to take to get that person uh, from junior into usable and then into senior. Uh, and you said, you know, how much time is it going to take? I would take that estimate and uh, times about 1.5 and <laughs> give yourself some cushion. Yeah. Yeah. Always erring on the side of caution, I think is smart. Uh, and, you know, once you've invested all that time and effort and money and, and all of that in that new hire, then the retention piece becomes very important. Uh, something I've talked about before. Uh, a lot of the pushback in in hiring more junior folks is that you know if we hire them and all of a sudden their market value shoots up through the roof in a year now that we've trained them, uh, they're way more likely to leave us. Um, and especially too, I think uh, retention rates are probably lower with Gen Z, uh, the, the younger folks out there. It's just you know how they grew up in um, I don't know a, a workforce where there's not as much loyalty as you know my my parents' generation. Um, they they kind of see themselves as disposable because they think that's how the corporations view them. So um, finding out a way to, like you said, give those folks a promotion path um, to listen to their suggestions, but then to also temper expectations a little bit. Say, look, you're not going to get that senior level role in a year. You're going to have to, you know, put in your time and your dues. We all had to do that. Um, but I think in, in order to uh, relay all of those concepts to somebody, it definitely takes some, some hands-on mentoring. Um, what do you say to the, to the folks that say, you know, I'm already working 70 hours a week. Um, it's really just not a priority for me right now to, to mentor people. I already have a really full plate. Can you make a case to that person to, to do so? Yeah, well, first off, someone comes to me and says they're working 70 hours a week. I'm empathetic with them already, right? You know, I worked through the, the age of ransomware cases, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, it's, it's no weekends off and it's no holidays for you know, 18 months at a time. So I, I can certainly empathize with that. I would tell them that the folks that we're, we're growing up are the ones that we're going to be leading in the future. So you may be working 70 hours a week now. At some point, I'm assuming you want to move into management or you want to uh, you know, be a more senior person over these others. These are the people that we need to train up and, and bring along with us. So I know it's tough, uh, but if you're working 70 hours a week and you're consistently working 70 hours a week, I think you've got to reassess what you're doing, right? We, we, we try to get more done, uh, you know, with the resources that we have. But if we're working our people 70 hours a week for, you know, months and years on end, then there's a problem there. So uh, I, I'm really empathetic to their dedication to the role, but at some point your family life has to come in balance here. So uh, you're asking for burnout. And if you can, <laughs> it doesn't take long to read any articles on LinkedIn about IT burnout and cybersecurity burnout. There was a recent stat that, uh, you know, 25% of CISOs leave the entire um, profession just because of the stress and burnout that they get. So I get that, that that's real. I think we need to be more proactive in that. And the more folks that we bring in and raise up, the less hours you'll have to work, right? If you can mentor this person and give them some of the grunt work that you don't want, which I know you talked about that with Joe Hudson, bringing in someone to do some of the grunt work, I think it's really a great idea to be able to say, okay, I'm not going to work 70 hours a week. I'm only going to work 60 hours a week, and I'm going to give this person the other 10. So those are things that I would encourage them to do. But I think you're right. The, the retention for um, the current generation is coming up behind us is, is much lower than it has been uh, previously for my generation or our parents' generation. So that's one of the ch challenges that we have to tackle. But if we aren't keeping people, and you, know, you mentioned your very first question is, you know, what happens if I train this person and, and hire them up and they become marketable? Um, well, what happens if you don't, right? Train this person and they didn't get any better, uh, I think we're in a, a worse spot anyway, right? So you want to pour in them and you want to train them up, but you also want to have a great culture and want to make them want to stay. 
Yeah. And, and to the point of, you know, retention and mentorship and things like that, when you look at it from a day to day leadership management perspective, I think it's important to structure into your responsibilities as a manager, as a hiring manager, as a leader, um, regular touch points with all of your employees. It helps you stay on top of all this stuff. Uh, you could do a, a formal quarterly check in with employees where it's not necessarily a review of their performance. It's more so how are things going? Are you struggling with anything? Uh, the, the closer you can stay to your employees, uh, the quicker you can identify any potential problems or flight risks, um, any potential threats to um, the, the culture that you're trying to build. If there's any toxicity brewing um, in if you feel like you don't have a good enough relationship with your team to do that or you're not close enough or, you know, since you're the boss uh, that it's difficult for them to be honest with you. Bring in a third party, get somebody else to do it. Uh, somebody, maybe the recruiter who brought them on or uh, an HR person, uh, put some sort of process in place where you can keep your eyes on folks and understand how things are going. Uh, and if you make that a priority, and again, I know it's tough to do if you have, you know, you're, you're working so many hours a week, um, but that's again, going to save you some time in the long run because it takes a lot of time and effort to hire somebody new if somebody leaves. Uh, and you know, even if you promote somebody up into that position, that's already on your team, you're still going to have to figure something out to backfill some position with, with that empty hole, uh, on your team. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, but I want to push back a little bit on that. I agree with the concept of having to check in, but I think if you're only doing it quarterly, uh, you're not doing a very good job. And I know we're all busy. I know it takes time, but I'd like to know the people on my team. My real passion in life is building and mentoring teams. And right now I'm doing it in security. I don't know where I'll be doing it in 10, 12, 15 years. But I think it's, it's important for uh, someone's manager to understand who they are and understand what their goals are. If you're only doing that four times a year, I don't think you're doing a very good job. So I would encourage folks to, to schedule those more often, right? Maybe you can't do it weekly. Maybe it's monthly or something else. But if you're only doing it every three months, I think you're not doing a very good job. Now, that's true for remote folks. But if you're still in an office, it's a little bit easier, right? Maybe we can have lunch together. We can get coffee, things of that nature. But now that we're such a diverse work um, structure, we've got to put place... Uh, placeholders in to, to be able to go through and have those meetings. But I, I really enjoy talking with the people that I work with, right? I, I want to know about their families and I want to know what their goals are and, and how I can best support them. Um, yes, I'm there to help this, the organization and make sure that the organization reduces risks and, and I want to be a business enabler, but it's also incumbent upon me as a leader to make sure I take these people in and, and help them up to be the best people they can be. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've had some really great guests on the show, including yourself. And uh, I, I hear from the leaders, the passion that, that, that they have and, and how much they enjoy mentoring people and things like that. I don't think everybody's built that way necessarily, um, which is kind of why I say, you know, quarterly check-ins just as a, a base level, just get something formalized. You know, if, if that's not something that you're doing now, something is, is better than nothing. Yeah. I think ideally it would be uh, more often than that. But if you're not doing currently anything, I think it's important to separate uh, the the more informal chats, more sort of culture building type of chats and separate that from the, the formal performance reviews. So you actually kind of build a little bit of a separation there. And I think that helps you um, separate performance from somebody's feelings about the team. Um, which is important and separate individual performance from team performance. I think it's important to have uh, different metrics or, or, you know, if you have KPIs, um, make sure that you're not just focusing on the group or just focusing on the individual. Um, I think uh, metrics, um, performance reviews, things like that, they shape behavior. So you have to be, you know, pretty careful about how you approach that and, and try and formalize everything. And again, I know that's, that's difficult to do sometimes. Um, are there anything, uh, any things like that that you've kind of built informally with your teams um, that you have found have been pretty successful uh, programs or um, I guess re review systems or anything like that? Yeah. So I typically send out an invite just as soon as someone joins um, and it's, it's a standing meeting. We have it, you know, for new hires, it might be once a week for the first you know, month or two. 
for folks who've been around some time, it might be every other week, it might be every month, something like that. But being really intentional about it, and I give them a list, here are the things that we're going to do. First off, I want you to be uh, bought into the time that we're going to have together. I want you to be covetous of this time. I want you to invest in it. I want you to be ready to come in and talk when we get there. Uh, I will also give you that same uh, commitment. So when we talk on Tuesdays at 2 p.m., uh, my time is dedicated to you at that point, and I will only cancel on you if there's uh, an emergent situation that I cannot get around. But I want you to come and be prepared to talk, right? Let's talk about the things that you're doing. Maybe that's home life. Maybe that's uh, work life. Maybe it's an issue that you're having with someone else inside um, the organization. But I want to understand what some of your challenges are. And I really want to know what challenges can I remove for you, right? If you need to be off on Thursday afternoons to take your kid to baseball, let's see how can we partner together and work on that. If you need to, you know, have, have a, a different uh, type of tool for working on whatever you're working on, let's figure that out. But it's really just taking that time and being intentional about it. I think that's what's critically important. Uh, people want to be inspired to work for good leaders. If you're a good leader, it's incumbent upon you to make sure that you're investing time into those people as well. So. I usually give them about six bullet points here, the things that we're going to do. Um, we're not necessarily talking about the work that you're doing. We're, all, we're talking more about you and how do we grow you in. Interesting. So um, one point that you kind of reminded me of there um, is, you know, very hands-on leadership style that you have there. Uh, I don't think everybody's necessarily cut out to be a true leader. Um, sometimes you have managers that you know, maybe they're very authoritative in their approach and people don't appreciate that. Or maybe they were a really good individual contributor, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a good manager or leader. Um, to, I guess the executives out there, how do you identify somebody who's going to be a good leader, uh, especially if they haven't actually done it before? Uh, you think they could be a good leader. There's somebody that you want to mentor into that leadership role, but you're not necessarily sure. Maybe they haven't done it before. How do you identify that future leader? Yeah, so, yeah, first off, you mentioned some folks are wonderful individual contributors and they should not be leaders. I 100% agree with that. Uh, you have to have a passion for growing people up and leading them to, to be a good leader. Uh, you know, this mindset that, we, oh, this person's been in the job for X number of years and they're an excellent uh, resource. We need to make them managers. Why? What, what is the purpose? They might not even want to do that. The only reason we're doing that is because uh, we're giving them a raise or we're, we're you know, changing their title or something else, and we're going to put five people under them. Well, just because they're a good individual contributor, that may not make them a good leader. So I think we've all had jobs where we worked for leaders who weren't uh, the best. You could tell that they were doing the job, but they were just doing the job. They didn't really have a passion for it. Uh, those are the kind of things that uh, you want to be aware of if you're a, a candidate, right? You want to understand uh, who you're going to work for and what kind of culture you're going into. And not every culture can be as hands-on as I like to be. I, I'm not a good fit for every uh, type of organization. So that's the things that we have to be concerned about. You asked, how do I identify leadership in, in folks? Uh, one of the key indicators that I've seen so far are folks who are previous um, military. Uh, they often have a strong sense of leadership, not just for getting the job done and, and taking care of business, but also taking care of the people around them. Uh, a good sense of teamwork um, is, is really helpful there. Also, folks who have contributed in uh, team sports, right? So it's folks who uh, maybe they played you know, basketball or football in high school or college or something else. Those folks tend to be good leaders because they've worked as a team. Uh, and again, I value team culture very much. That's not the same culture that you have in every organization. But if I'm looking for someone who's going to lead that way, folks who have participated in team sports um, are always uh, really good for that. Also, I think, uh, again, folks who have been in customer service and have a passion for serving people, if you uh, understand how to serve people and you understand caring about people and being empathetic with them, I think that gives you a leg up as a leader. Awesome points. Um, how would you differentiate somebody or between somebody that is a good team player and somebody who's good at actually leading that team? Are there certain characteristics that you would look for that's present in one and not the other? Yeah, so first off, I wanna look at, uh, if they bring a resume to me or I'm having an interview with them, I'm going to look at what did you do on that team? Yes, I see all these wonderful things you did. Really great job, I think that's awesome. But how did you help the rest of the team? Did you show someone else how to do this process that you developed? Are you ensuring that there's someone behind you to take your place once you leave? Uh, and, and that's one of my main uh, 
<laughs> one of my main goals as a manager is to have someone behind me ready to go if I decide to go do a different opportunity, right? If the company raises me up and puts me in a different role, I got to have someone backfill behind me ready to take over. And I think that's really important. Senior folks need to make sure they've got someone around them that understands what they're working on and can duplicate what they're doing. This is not the time for folks to hoard all the information, right? We've all worked with people who, oh, well, I know this one thing and that's my job security. No, that's a terrible way to go. So let's make sure that we have people who are uh, ready to go behind us. How did you help the team? What are the things that you did outside of your silo? You had these you know, 40, 50, 60, sometimes 70 hours a week. What did you do to help the rest of the team? How did you impact the rest of the team and train the rest of the folks up? If you can tell me what you've done or, or how you created a mesh like that, I think it's really powerful. So, yeah, so you're almost kind of looking for, for people that um, they have their job description, they have their duties, but it's somebody who's going above and beyond without being told to. It's just something that they want to do. Uh, they, they take charge. You know, that's, that's what a leader does. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah, leadership isn't about title always, right? I could have a, a, a peer group and someone, they may all have the same uh, title, but there's going to be a natural leader of that group, right? One person who uh, ensures others have what they need to be successful and helps others when they can. So leadership very rarely has anything to do with title. And folks who have to wield their title around to get power to have leadership probably don't deserve it anyway. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed, especially on LinkedIn. There's there's a lot of influencers and, and folks that have uh, self-appointed lofty titles. And I think generally the the best leaders are the ones that don't need to announce it, that other people label them as a leader versus, you know, being being self-applied. So you'd mentioned kind of succession planning. I think that's super important, especially if you end up having somebody leave and then you need to backfill their position. And then, like you said, always having somebody coming up behind you. Have you formalized your succession planning? Are there any, I guess, best practices you could share there? Or is it more kind of an informal thing? Yeah, it's mostly informal. Uh, during, during the conversations that I have uh, with my people, I'm, I'm always probing and asking you know, what their goals are and things of that nature. I want to understand, is this a role that you might think you want to be, right? Again, I want to have some play, someone to come in behind me if my company raises me up and puts me in a different role. So I'm asking probing questions to understand. I'm not promising, hey, in six months, you're going to have my job. Uh, just keep it up. You know, that, that's not a, a good way to be. But I'm always asking those questions like, do you see yourself as a leader? Do you think you could lead this team? And then I also uh, reverse that as like, I see how well that you work together with the rest of the team. I think you're a natural leader and I kind of encourage that behavior that way. So if does something does come up, then it, it's much easier for me to transition them in. But I've always got someone, sometimes two people in the back of my mind that could be doing the roles that I'm doing and could step in uh, any, any time I need to be out. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so this may be kind of a, a pointed question, but um, I think a lot of folks are mostly unaware of, of their biases in a lot of cases. Um, how do you ensure that when you're you're taking on a mentee or you're fostering somebody's leadership ability, how do you ensure that you're not succumbing to like me bias and it's somebody who's actually, you know, the the most qualified to to be that future leader? Man, so that's uh, have we got another hour where we could talk because there's a lot we could unpack there. But I think you're right. I think first off. Just voicing and, and knowing that we have these inherent biases um, is critical, right? Understanding that uh, we have biases built in. There are things that we're going to see. We want to uh, hire people that uh, you know act like us or talk like us or have a similar career as us, uh, but they're not always the best people for the job. So I think the very first thing is understanding that biases do exist. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong from the get-go. They, they aren't self-reflective or self-aware enough to know that biases um, it, uh, exist. The second thing I'd like to do is to make a matrix, right? Of all the things, all the people that I'm working with, here are the things that I think make uh, my job interesting and make my job, um, make me successful in my job. Do they have these same qualities or are there other qualities that they're actually better at? There are a lot of folks who are, are better than me at a lot of different things, right? Maybe they're more technical, maybe they can uh, deal with red tape better than I, multiple different things, right? Uh, here are the intangibles, here are the things that I don't have, and this person has them. So if this role could grow, the role that I'm in now, if it could be better, 
how could we make it better? And maybe that takes a person who likes doing documentation more than I do or something else. So I think it's important to understand the biases, uh, but there's, it's a whole huge subject. But you said the very first thing that I think of that we have to have bias uh, uh, awareness, right? And, and that includes self-awareness. Yeah. So to, to anybody out there who's curious, I mean, you can literally just Google um, biases, common human psychological biases, and you'll find a list of the most common ones. Like me, biases is one of those. Uh, and a lot of them are pretty well known to, to happen in the interview process. Um, so it's, it's worth looking up for sure. Uh, so, uh, one, one thing I definitely want to make sure that we covered before we, uh, we, uh, hit the, the end button here, um, entry level hiring, we, we kind of covered, um, but you said you had some pretty strong opinions to me previously about, uh, experience versus, uh, uh, certifications versus education. How do you see those, you know, which of those is most important and what do you look for in the people that you hire? So I thought that was an offline conversation, Peter. You're trying to get me mixed into this uh, <laughs> this uh, controversial debate. Um, so yeah, I've got a pretty unique um, perspective here. So I hold um, six or seven SAN certifications. I've got a couple uh, computer degrees, and I've got about you know ten or twelve years experience. So I have all of the things that people are debating between. So um, I think. <laughs> I know that what I've learned the most is from seat time, from experience. So being in front of that sim and someone giving me, a, you know, I need a report that says X or I need to find a, a log that tells me Y. That seat time, uh, there is no replacement for it. So learning an enterprise environment, learning the tool and being um, involved in that. But what I would say is I would rather have someone that has passion and. So if you have passion and a certification or if you have passion and experience, if you have passion and a college degree, that's what I'd much rather see. Uh, passion is something that I can't teach you, right? I can teach you all the ones and zeros. I can tell you what all the indicators of compromise are. I can tell you all the things that you need to pull as evidence from an incident, but I can't teach you passion. So if you come to me and you have passion and you can demonstrate that, that you know, you're reading blogs and you're building these things on your own and you're spending your own time doing it. I think that is the biggest indicator of someone's trajectory. If they've got passion for a role and passion for what they're doing, I would rather have them any day than someone who has both experience and a certification and a college degree. But I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, in my experience working with hiring managers across the field, experience is the thing that everybody wants. Um, and then the intangible of, of passion. Um, experience more than anything. Uh, it could just be the, the anecdotal sample of, you know, hiring managers that I've worked with that prioritize, uh, the, the experience over certifications. Um, there's another conversation I had where I think it's more common to value certifications in the GRC space, um, versus some others, uh, and then certain certifications more valued than others. SANS kind of the gold standard OSCP gold standard, um, CEH less so, you know, stuff like that. Um, but I think it, it depends on the individual, their background, what they're looking to do. Obviously, lots of depends there. Um, but experience above all else, I would say, for me. Uh, yeah, I agree with you there. And one thing I'll mention about certifications, uh, when I see that someone has one or multiple SAN certifications, I think that's great. I'm a big fan of SANS. But what it also tells me is whoever their previous employer was thought enough about them to spend seven, eight, nine thousand dollars on a SANS course for them. So that tells me that they may be a person uh, that I want to look at as well. So just something yeah, to throw out that's there. That's a great point. They they that company felt them worth investing in. So that could be another indicator of uh, of merit beyond you know the the typical things that you would you would look for. Sure. So um, last question for me, uh, something I ask everybody: Is there something in the security field that we're not talking about that, but that we should be, uh, especially as it relates to hiring? Yeah. So this um, will likely be an unpopular opinion, especially uh, with the audience that we're talking to today, but. I believe that cybersecurity salaries are a bit inflated. Uh, and first off, I realize it's free market capitalism. I realize uh, you know, when supply and demand are out of whack, then that creates uh, some inflation. Uh, but I think, and I also think someone should command whatever salary they're, they are being paid, right? 100% agree with all those things. But more companies are having to pay more and more for cybersecurity professionals. And there aren't, there's only so much money to go around. So. Uh, 
there's going to be more folks working 70 hours a week because they're making a larger salary, but we don't have enough money to buy uh, another resource to help you with. So I think that's something that that's going to uh, regulate at some point. We talked about you know, the, the profession being relatively immature, but at some point uh, we have to get to an equilibrium of what salaries are and, and what expectations are. And as the supply and demand balances and we get more mature, I think that will happen. But again, I think the, the salaries are a bit inflated now and I'm all for it. Like I understand where it's coming from and, and I will reap the benefits while I can. But I think it's something that's going to, uh, a natural adjustment is going to occur. So I would encourage folks to be uh, thinking about that. Yeah. That's a really good point, and it's something I've seen happen, uh, especially with DFIR Consulting. I've worked with a lot of those firms over the years, and uh, it, it almost perfectly matched what you you just mentioned, where uh, there for the longest time there was a shortage and salaries kept ballooning, and at some point it hit a, a critical mass and companies couldn't afford to hire those senior-level DFIR people anymore, especially as the rates for the work that they were doing were going down. So they were going in opposite directions. And what ends up happening is everybody ends up being overworked uh, and you hire less people that are doing more uh, and then they burn out, then kind of everybody is in a bad position and then the market crash and it rubber banded back the other way. Um, and now there's a lot of people out of work that you know a year ago you, you had to pay out the nose for. Um, so it's a really wild time for sure. I think the market's correcting a little bit from from what I'm seeing, at least anecdotally, um, just with the, the terrible economy that we're in now and, and stuff like that. But we'll see how it plays out in the next year. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of highs and lows. Um, but yeah, great point, Chris. Well, appreciate you being on. It's been a great conversation and would love to have you on again sometime. Uh, to anybody else uh, that's listening here, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, I love networking with people. You can find me at uh, chrisverdick.com. You can get the LinkedIn and email and things of that nature there. But if you go to chrisverdick.com, you'll see some of the things that I'm working on and would love people to reach out and connect and, and let's have a conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody.